It has been a few days since all of this is running and I wanted to just give you a quick update on what happened and what did not happen. This thing has been running for about three days now. Yeah, three or four days ago that we filmed the whole filling part and then when we were done with that I moved the whole thing over to the benchmarking working table over there and I wanted to start uh, working with it. I wanted to start finding out how do fans perform on radiators. The fact that I have the motherboard in my hand that I initially installed already uh, says a lot about how this went. So when I moved it around I started it up but we had no image, no boot, no post, no nothing. So I did the usual troubleshooting steps, I uh, reseated the RAM, nothing happened. I took other RAM, nothing happened. I reseated the other RAM, nothing happened. And this went on for a bit too long. Then I reseated the water block, nothing happened. I switched the PSU, so I just took a second one and mounted all the cables, nothing happened. It, nothing happened forever and uh, of course I was just furious and I, and I went home and I didn't want to speak about it and the next day when I returned I had an idea because the problem with this motherboard over here is that there are no like indication lights for issues uh, which isn't always the case but it is more the case on mini ITX boards given that there is not much uh, space to, to put any lights on them but there are enough motherboards that have lights, but this one doesn't. So I had no clue what was going on. And uh, very fortunately, I remembered... Where is it? Here. I remembered that I have a bunch of these laying around, these little speakers that you can put in. So I found one of them, which was uh, surprisingly hard, and I installed it on the Mini ITX motherboard. Unfortunately for myself, the beep code or boot code was uh, five short ones, which in ASRock language is uh, some sort of CPU error. So I reseated the CPU, nothing changed. I reseated it again, nothing changed. And I did it again and nothing changed. I checked all the connections. I, I checked the, the pins on the ALGA socket. I checked the pads on the CPU. Nothing seemed to be broken to me. However, uh, this motherboard and the CPU were lying inside the Intertech IM1 case. Uh, and they were there for, I have no clue how long. I know that the board works, I, I know that it, it did work at some point, but apparently in the last year, where I never used it even once, somewhere in between then and now, the thing died. I have no clue if the CPU is dead, I have no clue if the motherboard is dead, but the problem was that I did not want to use any of my 12th and 13th gen CPUs because I still need them. But I didn't need the 10600K, 10700K. The next problem was I have exactly one Z590 board, which is this one, and I have exactly one 10 or 11 series CPU, which is the 10700K that is in here. So I had no possibility to cross check if which of the two components is that. I, I still have no clue and I was unwilling to buy some old ass CPU just to check it or some old ass motherboard just to check it. I didn't want to do that. So I declared this thing just dead. I will throw it somewhere in, in some shelf and pretend like all of this never happened. Now the next step was to figure out how we can deal with this now. The problem is I cannot take any of my AMD platforms because I have more than enough AMD CPUs and I cannot take them because the water block we use in here is LGA 12 or 1700, so that was an issue. However, I remembered that I still have my 9900K lying around and that's a, what, 1150, 1151? This LGA socket, which is identical to the LGA 1200. So that's what I did. I took my old, I don't want to say anything wrong, MSI MPG Z390 Gaming Edge AC and a bunch of other keywords. I slapped my old 9900K in there, installed it, mounted the water block, and we had post. We had post, we had boot, we had everything. It now finally worked and it took me a good day and I was furious. 
Now, of course, a 9900K pushes a lot more than a 10700K, though not, not that much. But we needed to, to adjust the settings a lot before starting to use these. So what I did was enable XMP, we had the ratio set to 46 or 4.6 GHz or core. We had all of those Intel Turbo and SpeedSap and whatever disabled. We set the core voltage to 1.3. We set the temperature protection to 115 degrees C, yeah that's important. And all of this resulted in a workload inside of Firmax CPU burner of between 135 and 150 watts, depending on how hot the CPU is at the time. So that means that for every radiator in here, we are pushing between 135 and 150 watts through it and then cooling it down with a fan. And it finally worked. It took so long just to start it up. We, of course, we have a fresh version of Windows. We had all of the, the updates done and then we just disabled all of the network cards to be sure that the Wi-Fi doesn't pick up or anything. We did all of the usual benchmarking speed stuff. Before I came up with the settings that I just told you, I needed to know where they are leading. And what I wanted to achieve is that the NF812X25 will barely make it all the way through. And all the way through means that I can push the fan speed down to 20% of whatever the fan is capable of doing and the A12 is barely making it. And as a reference radiator I use the regular 120, so the 30mm thick, I don't want to say anything wrong, I think it's 12 FPI, yeah. 12, yeah. The 120mm 12 FPI model. The A12 needs to be able to barely do it on that one at 20%, at 20% of its max speed. And it did. It did manage to go from 100 down to 20. We just took two measurement points up until now, but it did manage to do that. Now, after, after the A12 made it, I repeated the same thing with the S12A and the F12. Uh, so the airflow focused and the static pressure focused, though this doesn't make a lot of sense because this is more static pressure, it's, it's the NFF useless. And it's so much useless and we will get to that. But we did two measuring points for every 120mm radiator for each of these fans. One at 100% fan speed and one at 20% fan speed. Uh, I will later on do it in 10% decrements, that's the end goal, but for now and to test this, this is what I needed just to have numbers and test if everything does still work. Now a few things on my new test bench, I, I freaking love it. This monitor here, which I now have in the front, because the motherboard is too big, but uh, so I needed to move it, but it works flawlessly. Oh my god, it works so flawlessly. And the whole system works flawlessly. So in this room, we have three of these Goovy temperature sensors, and they are distributed across the room. This one is the one that is usually sitting up there. And what I do is press all of the loads through the radiator, cool it down, and then I write down the temperature of the water. And what happens here is that you ignore any spikes, especially on Intel CPUs, especially on the 9900 k which is just jumping up two or three degrees C, up and down, up and down, up and down, and the water absorbs all of that. So you have a nice even average number, you have the water temperature, and you are measuring what the fan can do to the water through the red, and not whatever the hell the CPU is doing. So the display is showing you one digit after the comma, so you have for example 38.7. And what happens once the water reaches the temperature that it will reach is the last digit will start jumping around. So you will have 37.8, 37.7, 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.7, it will jump around and it's, it's really fun to watch. But what will also happen is that the room will, will slowly heat up, especially if I test fan after fan after fan. Of course I also have some air circulation in the room with fans so that I have some sort of normality in here but you will have a higher temperature over time, that's just what will happen. So that's why we have these temperature sensors, so I can always measure the, the room temperature live, and then I can deduct the, the room temperature from the radiator temperature or the water temperature, and then I have um, delta above ambient. And what's really funny is that these here are also displaying it with a single digit after the comma, and sometimes 
the display and these here are fighting with switching the last number. So one goes one, point 0.1 up, the other one goes point 0.1 down and then they switch all the time. And I can track this on my phone with the display next to it, you can just see tick 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 tick. Yeah, so, so you know you are accurate. Now I repeated these tests over three days, yeah, two or three days. Um, and for every day we were in a margin of 0.3 degrees C, which is excellent. It is, it is really good. The biggest difference, I think it was the F12, was 0.3 degrees C. All of the other ones were smaller or on the 0. degree C exact. So I'm really, really glad that all of this turned out to be somewhat stable and repeatable after a longer period. That, that's what we are aiming for. I need to be sure that if I slap an A12 on the thick radiator in two years, it will still result in the exact same temperature. And that's what happened here. So I'm very, very glad how all of this turned out. Now the question that I was most fearful of was if it was even worth it taking three different radiators with different thicknesses and different finch per, in finch per inches, so uh, different uh, densities to test radiator fans for. And you know what? I was so freaking right. So I have very few numbers for today. It's just to showcase that all of this is working and we will repeat everything and do it in 10% decrements at one point later. But for today, it's just peak performance, every radiator, every 120 millimeter radiator. So for the normal one, which is 30 millimeters and 12 FPI, the A12 of course won. It was 12.8 degrees C above ambient. Now, the water was 12.8 degrees C above ambient. The F12 and SA12 on the other hand were surprisingly close to each other. So a F12 reached 16.1 degrees C above ambient and a S12A reached 16.8. So yeah, of course, the F12, or the static pressure of the F12 and the speed, of course, we are measuring it very accurately. That, that's really the case here, but still 0 0.7, 0 0.7 degrees C, that's a freaking joke. From an A12 up, that makes a lot of sense. That really does make a lot of sense, but F12 versus S12A, that's, that's just kind of a joke. Now this is just how they perform, period. Now we know it. But the interesting portion will be once we switch over to different radiators. So let's go to the HPE one, the, the higher fin density one. The one where higher static pressure numbers should perform better. And we saw here roughly what I expected. The A12 managed to keep the water at 12.4 degrees C above ambient, which is okay. It's what I expected. The F12, on the other hand, managed to pull off 15.7. So again, the A12 is so much better than the, than the F12. And the S12A, it got left slightly behind at 16.6. .6. So using the higher density radiator, we can see that the difference between these two here becomes bigger and bigger with this one falling behind, which makes total sense. It's exactly what I expected. However, once we switched over to the thick one, the one with just 10 FPI, but freaking 60 millimeters, or is it even more? 80, 80 millimeters. This thing is so freaking insane. 80 millimeters. There the A12 managed to keep it at 10.7 degrees C above ambient. And the F12 and S12A managed to keep them at 14.7 and 14.6 respectively. Yeah, the S12 won by 0.1 degrees C. Now, of course, this is margin of error. I do know that. But it does show that the, that the line between these two get really blurry once you are moving to thicker, or no, to, to bigger radiators that are less dense. And it becomes so freaking blurry that this one won. And I tested that three times on three different days. It won every time. It is insane. So unfortunately for my workload from now going on, because a single measuring point takes like 15 to 20 minutes, it's, it takes insanely long, but it does show one thing that you cannot test a fan on 
one radiator and then say fan A is better than fan B because they can switch. Going from a high density red to a very low density red showed that a airflow fan can outperform a not so much airflow but way more static pressure fan. Why? Because there is just no need for the static pressure. If you look at Noctua's spec sheets, you will see that a S12A pushes more air than a F12, but at a, at a very much lower static pressure. But what if that static pressure is not used or is not necessary? Well, then the superior airflow of the S12A will start to make some major, major points. And that's what happened here. Now, of course, you still have the A12, which just, yeah, it, it just destroyed everybody. That thing is just, just insane. You are not able to just look at the specs, pretend like nobody lied there, and then determine how they will perform. Things will change. There are more things than just static pressure and airflow. However, it's an indicator, and testing it like this gives me the possibility to determine exactly for what use case what fan is better. And as shocked as I was, there are use cases where you would want to use an S12A as a radiator fan instead of an F12. Although it's, I expected the line to become blurry, but nothing more. I expected that at some point these two will move closer and closer and closer together, but apparently they just switch places, which is incredible. Of course, margin of error, but the line becomes so freaking blurry, it's, it's completely insane. Oh, and on the 20% of the max speed performance aspect, we don't really need to talk about it because only the A12 managed to pull it off on each red. The other two, yeah, thermal throttle. Because I need to let everything thermal throttle after uh, 60 degrees C because the pump is rated to run at max 60 degrees C uh, water temperature. The CPU is sitting always somewhere in between 95 and 110. Uh, which is fine, that's why I, I moved that max temperature protection up because I need to keep it at that, that load all the time. Uh, and, I can, and I need to do that because that way I can just shut off the fan and then wait a couple of minutes, the CPU will go at that 110, 115 and just stay there at 150 watts load and it will heat up the water and then I can switch the fan back on and, and then I am already at a temperature level that will settle rather quickly. Like if I know that the, the A12 will barely make it through 20% uh, fan speed, then I can already heat up the water beforehand instead of waiting 20 minutes for the water to go from 30 to 50 degrees C and then wait another 10 minutes until it settles down somewhere. So I can heat it up quickly and then just let it settle. It, it saves a lot of time and that's why I have that protection smashed to the roof where uh, I wouldn't recommend doing that for your personal build, but for a test bench that works fine. But hey, uh, I guess now it's just a lot of work ahead. I will repeat the benchmarks for all three of these, because I need them in 10% increments. Right now I just have full blast and oh wow, just one fan managed to pull it over 20, and so I need to do it anyway. Uh, also, something that I need to do from now on is record the noise level of a fan with a red behind because it significantly changes and I cannot, for example, take all of my sound measurements that I did free air uh, years ago and then apply them here because they will change. And there are fans that I know of that will change drastically, noise blocker for example. So I, I first need to do that and then I need to test every single fan, it, it takes so freaking long. But it's, I think, I hope it will be worth it. I hope the results will paint a very complete picture instead of just taking one single red, one AIO, which I guess most people are doing, and then slapping a fan on there. Yeah, you are, you are interpreting the performance right, but it's just for that one given AIO. And if you, once you go into custom, things will change rather quickly. I saw it, these two switch places, which, doesn't make a lot of sense, but that's the measurement. So uh, I, I'm glad that I can now paint a very, very complete picture with this one. But for today, this is going to be it. It's just an update on how things went, how badly they went, and how we will proceed from here on. So I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you will stick around, because uh, we will now get some really accurate numbers with this thing. But I hope to see you on the next one, and bye-bye.